I know, you know, before the before lunch gig is always better than the after lunch gig, but notwithstanding, this is the during lunch gig, so presumably you won't fall asleep while you're eating, so that's the hope at any rate. Can you see me down here or do you need me up a little higher? Does it make any difference? One way or the okay, okay, here. All right. Well, so this afternoon, what I want to do, and I promise this, I've only got about uh, 15 slides or, show, or, or so that I'm going to work through. But what I want to do is to walk through a little bit about what it means to engage in a Wesleyan spirituality for congregational life. Pick up what I talked about in the sermon this morning, but we're going to talk more specifically about John Wesley. And we're going to talk about uh, some ways of very practically uh, drilling into what it looks like in order to be uh, a faithful congregational witness moving towards holiness. And uh, I use the word vitality here. Some of you may know that's a buzzword in the United Methodist Church now of having vital congregations. Um, <laughs> there we go, Tom. You like that one. The, uh, the vital congregations idea. And uh, it's not a Wesleyan word. Wesley never talked about there being vital congregations, per se. And uh, a big part of that was simply that to be vital is too small of a goal for Wesley. Right? To be vital is just to be alive. Well, Wesley assumed you wanted to be alive. He wanted to push for more than that, right? He wanted to push for something beyond just being alive and healthy. And so, um, Wesley wanted to move people towards holiness. And you heard this in the sermon this morning, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. This is really a helpful verse to key off of in understanding pretty much everything that Wesley did. And that's, this is the whole verse, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. For Wesley, the question was not, do you have a vital congregation that hits certain kinds of markers of vitality? For Wesley, the question is, are you holy? Are you striving after holiness? And do you have fruits, what he would call the fruits of holiness in your life? Uh, are you demonstrating that God is active in your life? That's what Wesley was really working toward. Now, Wesley... In a lot of ways, when you talk about this idea of holiness, it sounds very individualistic. And there is an individual piece to it. In the end, Wesley believed that all of us were going to face judgment one-on-one -on -one before God. But that doesn't mean he didn't care about a group. He didn't care about how a group of people would gather together to engage in the seeking after holiness. Again, much like we talked about in the sermon in uh, the passage from Acts. Wesley has this famous quote, there is no holiness but social holiness. And what the argument he's making there is this. A lot of people hear that quote and it gets misquoted. It's misquoted where they think Wesley is talking about engaging in social justice activity. That's not what he's talking about. In this particular quote, Wesley is talking about whether or not uh, you can strive after holiness on your own. In the end, well, we do have to be holy individually before God. He said it's almost impossible to, to do that by yourself. I mean, he acknowledged that there are some people that are hermits and monks and go off and do that by themselves. And he said that's fine. But most of us need other people around us so that we can work towards holiness together. And that's what he meant by this. There's no holiness but social holiness. We need to encourage one another onto a life of holiness. We need a group of people to do that. And for Wesley, he experimented with different kinds of groups of people in order to, uh, to help them promote holiness. And we'll talk about these different groups, the bands, the classes, and the societies in just a little bit. Now, a warning. This is what I finished up with in the sermon. Um, at the outset, what we've got to acknowledge is that Wesley's vision for what a kind of group of people that are moving towards holiness, what his vision is for that, is not something that can just be developed through program. It's not something you can just kind of, you know, add a line item budget uh, or a piece in the budget and, and run with it or something where you get a couple of volunteers to kind of take charge of it. It's something that really gets deeply into your life. Um, it's intrusive, in effect, because it's forcing individuals and groups of those individuals to change the way that they're living, to re, re, uh, reform how it is that they think about life, how they engage in their daily life. 
So I want to be clear about that at the outset. And again, this is something that pushes back against some of the denominational requirements for a vital congregation today, which tend to be pretty programmatic. And they say, you know, if you hit these things, if you do these things, you'll be a vital congregation. For Wesley, you can have all the right form and be missing the substance. And so there's a famous quote he has at the, near the end of his life when he says that he fears for the Methodists that one day they would be a dead sect that had the form of godliness without the substance or without the power of it. Um, and so that's something that we need to keep in mind going into this, is that Wesley was not suggesting just a minor church program here, or even a major church program. He was talking about transformed lives. Um, Wesley and spirituality. If you're going to start with this, I think a helpful way to get in when you're talking about holiness and especially recognizing that it's so intrusive and transformative, is to recognize that Wesley realized that people are at different places. So if as a congregation you want to seek after this kind of holiness, you don't do it by just having a single cookie cutter way of engaging in it. That doesn't work. Instead, you need to help people recognize where they are in their movement toward holiness, and then meet them in that place and give them a group of people who are alongside of them, and they can work together towards maturity in their faith. Um, and Wesley would say that it's by the fruits of their holiness, by how they're living, that you can know where they are. This is something that Wesley did. Wesley made room for different kinds of people to be able to move in their faith wherever they happen to be in their faith. So he didn't judge people. He didn't say, you know, well, you're not as mature as you are, and so you're not as much of a Christian. What he said is, let's meet you where you are and then help you move forward. And that's what he did. So let me point to things here. Um, so he came up with these different groups, and he had the preaching services. This is the first one. The preaching service was for anybody who wanted to come. It didn't matter if you were a Christian or not. He didn't care. The point of the preaching service was to throw the doors open and let whoever wants to come listen to the to the propagation of the gospel. Wesley did outdoor preaching. You've heard of his field preaching maybe before. Wesley never liked field preaching. He never wanted to do it. He kind of got shamed into doing it by his best friend at the time, George Whitfield. And uh, so he went and he did it, and he found that it was profoundly effective because lots of people that would never darken the door of a church were willing to just stand out in the middle of a field and listen to a preacher, and they could be out on the, you know, be anonymous, just come in on the edges and sort of listen and then leave. And so Wesley had this. This was a group of sorts. It was a sort of unformed group. It didn't have a lot of cohesiveness, but it was an easy, low-threshold way for those that just needed to hear the Christian message to begin with. For those that heard the message of the gospel and they wanted to do something about it, not that they had become Christians yet, but to put it in Wesley's terms, they wanted to flee from the wrath to come, meaning that they realized that their life wasn't quite the way it ought to be, and they wanted to do something to change it. He had what he called the classes. The classes were a group of about 12 people, roughly, that would get together. It was entirely laity. There were no clergy involved in this. And in the classes, they would basically talk to each other about what does it mean to be a Christian in the culture that we live in. So if you had a group of people who were miners, coal miners that lived outside in Kingswood, just outside of Bristol, they'd get together and talk about what does it look like to be a Christian if we uh, live here, if we're miners outside of Bristol and we have this kind of terrible subsistence existence that we're living in. Uh, if they were the dock workers that are over in the wharfs off of uh, Bristol, that are dealing with the slave trade primarily, what is it that we're doing here? How do we be Christians? How can we be Christians in the midst of this? So these classes were very contextual, and they would meet people where they were. What's interesting about the classes is that they used, were made up partly of Christians. There, were, there was usually one leader who was a fairly committed Christian. There might be a few others, but then several other people who were just inquiring, who had been to the preaching service and wanted to check all of this out. And so they would come to the classes just to see what it's like to be a Christian and listen to the Christians talk to each other about what does it look like to try to be a Christian where we live. So you didn't have to be a Christian to come here. Again, pretty low threshold. But you had to be willing to say, I'm going to check it out. I'm going to see what it's like. 
Um, and in fact, there's a study that's been done, never was published, one of the best dissertations that's never been published by the guy who heads the upper room, you know the little upper room devotional? Tom Albin, who's the dean of the upper room, uh, did a wonderful study where he showed the average person took 18 months from when they first came to a class to when they actually proclaimed that they were a Christian. They proclaimed faith in Christ. So 18 months of just checking it out before they actually made a decision to follow Christ. Now, for those who were Christians in the classes, there needed to be a way to help encourage them, uh, to encourage them specifically in their Christian faith. And so Wesley had the societies. The societies were made up of all the people who were committed Christians that were in the classes in a geographical area. And usually they were defined by a quarterly meeting, so quarterly conference, um, where people would get together and share what was called a love feast. It wasn't communion, but it was very communion-esque, right? They would get together. And usually this was a, even though it was a larger group, it was a very, very uh, intimate group because these were the Christians that were all working together to help those who were finding their way. So it was kind of all the mentors getting together. And they would get together and were deeply committed to each other. And if you read the journals of early Methodists, they talk about the kind of incredibly intimate, close, and emotional times that, uh, that these society meetings were for them, how important they were. Um, and this is pretty remarkable, because these are bricks we're talking about, right? So the fact that they're showing all this emotion, you know, you wouldn't see that much emotion again until Downton Abbey came out uh, with the British. So that's what you've got with the societies. And they were so serious about guarding the kind of the uh, integrity of this, you had to get a ticket from Wesley himself to go to these. He actually would come in and he would in, in, uh, inquire after how you were living your, your life. And if you were showing sufficient fruits in, uh, in holiness, then you were given a ticket that were monogrammed with the JW, John Wesley's initials, and you could come to the society meeting. Finally, you have the bands. The bands were a small group, usually about six people, that would gather together and would really dig into each other's lives. These were the folks who wanted to take striving after holiness to the next level. And they would uh, get with each other and they'd ask questions like, what did you do this past week you don't want to tell us about? Um, and then they'd answer each other. That's the thing. So this was a group that was really serious about holding each other accountable for living into the holiness of God. Um, the bands took several different forms and Wesley was constantly fiddling with this. And he's constantly tweaking this, modifying the model uh, all through his career because Wesley didn't get doctrinaire about structure. For him, structure served the mission of holiness. And if something didn't work, he got rid of it. And if something else seemed like it would work, he'd try it. And so he was constantly tweaking this, but this is sort of the general structure of what he put into place. The key thing here is that if you want to be a vital congregation, if you want to use those terms, in the Wesleyan model, what you've got to do is make room for people at all these points. It's not often that we think in the church today about meeting people where they are spiritually. We'll meet people where they are in other ways, but we don't think about sort of where they are in relationship to holiness. And for Wesley, that was the chief indicator that he connected with, and it was remarkably effective. Um, and one of the things that's interesting is that if you diversify on the basis of holiness, other things of diversity tend to click into place, right? Suddenly issues of uh, race and ethnicity and all of that don't matter as much because people are just slotting in wherever they are and suddenly you're with a group of people that's diverse by the standards of the larger world because they're connected at a certain place spiritually with each other and the church has made room for that. Now once within the appropriate group it required a commitment, right? And we've talked about this. It requires a commitment and chiefly here to vulnerability. Right? They had to be willing to share what's going on in their lives. And they had to be willing to let other people see both their successes and their failures. Two things we don't like talking about too much. You know, there's a tendency in the American mainline church to sort of gloss over the differences. As far as most of us are concerned, when we walk into the church, we're all basically middle class, we all basically live the same lives, and we all basically are alike. And this was a place where you could come in and say, you know what, I really nailed 
nailed it this week. I did something really good here. And people could celebrate with you, and you weren't being prideful or, or inappropriate. But you could also walk in and say, you know what, I really blew it this week. And you weren't coming in to get judged, and you weren't going to feel terrible about yourself, but you were going to come in and have others share your burden with you and help you get back up and walk along to the next level. And so this vulnerability is really critical. And this isn't something you can engineer, right? You can't just say, you know, let's at the next, uh, at the next uh, nominating committee meeting, you can't just say, you know, okay, who wants to volunteer to be on the committee of vulnerability for the church, you know? And, and just have, you know, these are the folks that will all be vulnerable and the rest of us will all be safe. They're doing it for us. It doesn't work that way. Everyone has to be able to do that, right? And so things like the tickets I already talked about, where you had to be vulnerable enough to tell Wesley, yeah, I've been living this way, or I haven't. The home visits were similar. In the classes, this is the classes, remember? These aren't folks who are necessarily Christian, but they're searching after it. The class leaders, again, these are laity, right? These are lay members. The class leaders would go and visit people in their homes and sort of take stock of how was that life working for them, right? Were, were they showing some changes toward the Christian faith? You know, were they treating their children well? Were they treating their, their spouse well? Was the house maintained in an appropriate way? I mean, it sounds silly, but you know the quote, uh, cleanliness is next to godliness? John Wesley said that. That's actually originally a Wesley quote, and it was precisely because he didn't want Christians living in squalor. And if you had the choice, Right? You use the money to clean up the house and make sure your kids and your wife are well-maintained rather than going and spending it on booze and, and, and prostitutes. <laughs> um, and so he was pushing people along this line. So you had to be vulnerable to the class leader coming and checking out. Is the house a little bit cleaner, right? Are there a few less whiskey bottles that are out front? Um, these are the things that they're looking at. Again, I've talked about this over and over, and not to, to beat it into the ground, but the laity piece really is just essential to all of this. Um, and I do want to, I mean, I'm not anti-clergy. I hope that you're not hearing that from me at all. Clergy provided a unique means of grace, according to Wesley, particularly being able to share the sacraments with others. The issue was, the reason why the clergy were not that essential to the early Methodist movement. Simply, there weren't enough clergy to go around. There was a period in Methodist history when there were only three clergy over the entire Methodist movement. Right? All of England. You had John, his brother Charles, and a friend of theirs who they had convinced to join on board because they had known him in Oxford. So when you've got three clergy and you've got a burgeoning national uh, revival going on, the clergy can't run the whole thing. And so you need the lady to step in and to, to take care of each other, to do the spiritual care of each other, to visit with each other, to exhort each other, to worship, and to lead the worship services with each other. Primarily, the whole reason laity were allowed to preach originally in the Methodist movement, which, by the way, before, it wasn't just that only clergy could do the sacraments, only clergy could preach, only the clergy could take a text and actually preach on it. The reason that Wesley let that go and allowed the clergy to, uh, or allowed the lady to do it, is simply he needed them to. If he didn't let them do it, no one was going to preach. No one was going to read the Bible. He needed to trust the lady to do that. So the lady took charge, and they did it, and they were excellent at it. And by the way, I don't have it, this is a whole separate lecture another time, but the women in particular were incredibly powerful. Early Methodist women did remarkable things. Um, there are whole books written about that. If you're curious about reading it, uh, you should look up, look up books by Paul Chilcote. Uh, Paul Chilcote is the dean down at Ashland Seminary in Ohio. And Paul has done some marvelous studies on specifically the role of women in the early Methodist revival and how they really took and ran with a lot of this stuff. So what are the means of grace? If you're going to live into a holy life, if that's the structure that you've got, and you've got this structure of the laity gathering together in different kinds of groups based on where they are spiritually, what are the different kinds of practices that they engaged in that would allow them to go deeper with each other, to be vulnerable with each other, and to receive the grace of God? Wesley argued that there were what were called means of grace. And for Wesley, the means of grace were special kinds of God-given gifts 
that allowed people to experience the presence of God more intimately in the here and now. That's what means of grace are. It's not that anyone is more important than the other in Wesley's way of thinking of it, but it's that they're all necessary because God said, I will specifically meet you in a unique way through these activities. And so Wesley used to say, do all of these as often as you can because you need to. Because this is, an, and not just you need to, but because it's a gift. I mean, why wouldn't you want to keep meeting with God as often as you can and to have the grace of God rub off on you? Why not feel the assurance of God's forgiveness as often as you can and the power of God to move you on to holiness as often as you can? Why not do that? And so there's a list that uh, he included in one place, and there, there are other lists. I mean, there's no master list that he has of this. But one of the most common lists included reading and hearing scripture. Notice he has reading and hearing. He, he suggests that there's an individual aspect where you're reading it on your own, but you're also hearing it, which means you're doing it together in a group because you have to hear someone else who's speaking. Prayer and fasting. Wesley was a big, big proponent of fasting. Um, and it's something we don't talk about much, although ironically, and it would be good for Tom to hear this, when you take ordination vows, one of the things that you promise to do is to teach fasting to your congregation, both by prayer, or excuse me, by uh, precept, by actually talking to people about it, and also by example. I know. <laughs> so enjoy those cupcakes before you get ordained. Um, <laughs> So that's something that you have that that Wesley saw as really critical is to bring fasting into it, and I don't know if that's something that uh, that Glenview's ever done. I will tell you that uh, when I was the pastor of just a little church, I mean, much smaller than Glenview outside of Baltimore, one of the things that I did is that for Lent I introduced the idea of a Lenten fast. And Jesus says you don't let other people know that you're fasting. I figured it was okay inside the church if we did that. We just weren't proclaiming it outside, and so we came up with a little fasting. Group And those who wanted to, there's no pressure. I'll tell you, the amazing thing about fasting, coming off of Wesley for just a second, fasting never happens apart from prayer. You never do it separately from prayer. It's all part of the same thing. And what fasting does is really help to focus your prayer. We had a youth group of one at the beginning of our time of prayer and fasting in the Lent. And we decided we would pray and fast specifically around the growth of, of our uh, youth group. We had a youth group of 30 by the end of that year. And it's, we, we had a, what would we have on us? Something like 80 people in the church. And we had a youth group of 30 by the end of the year. I'm convinced that we, we had suddenly had some incredible youth leaders who came to volunteer. We suddenly had uh, the one person that we had there start inviting other people to come and they would stick and invite other people. It was amazing to watch the growth. There's something really powerful about attending to God through prayer and fasting. Worship attendance. Wesley saw that as critical. By the way, for Wesley, that was a multi-thing because you had regular worship at the Anglican Church. Remember, Wesley is a priest of England. And he assumed you were going to the, to, uh, the Anglican Church on Sunday. And then, in addition, you would holy conference where you get together their class or band or society or whatever it was that you were in as well. So this is, there are multiple things that you're attending here to move into holiness. And then, of course, Holy Communion. Wesley saw the sacrament as critical. That's a major reason why you attended worship, was to receive Holy Communion. Not just these kinds of... If you just stop with that list, there can be a tendency to think that Wesley was mostly interested in us individually, and sort of in, in the group in more terms of piety. Am I doing things that are pious? Am I showing a kind of pious life? And, Praying and fasting and, and taking communion in the life. But Wesley realized that a holy life required much more than that. And so he developed basically a set of ethics by which people could figure out how to engage the culture around them. So that it's not just what I'm doing in my own personal life and in my life in my small group. But what am I doing and how I relate to everyone around me as well when I get out to the workplace, when I get out to wherever it is that I'm in my daily commerce? And you've probably heard of them. They're Wesley's three simple rules. Sometimes they're called the general rules. And they simply read this. Do no harm. Do all the good you can. And attend upon the ordinances of God. Right? So 
the ethics were these. If you're a Methodist, whenever you do something, ask the question, am I going to hurt myself or hurt anyone else by doing it? And if I will, then don't. I shouldn't do it. That, that's off, off limits for me. Likewise, do all the good you can. If an opportunity arises to do good, take it. It doesn't matter if it's in your comfort zone. It doesn't matter if it's something that you're fam that familiar with. If there's the opportunity to do good, even if it's socially awkward to do it, do it. These were the ethics of relating to the world. And then what we just talked about, the different practices, the means of grace were the ordinances of God. He said, attend on those because you need to. If you don't do that, you won't be spending the intimate time with God that you need to fill you up with the power necessary to keep refraining from harm and doing good. So all of it's a reinforcing ethic. This is what I do internally and with my small group in my congregation to prepare myself. And here's how I go out and live with the larger world around me. I think it's interesting that towards the end of his life, Wesley took these ideas and he modified them a little bit specifically to deal with the issue of wealth. Because the Methodists be were becoming wealthier by this point. Um, Wesley had taken, and there have actually been arguments, which may be a little <coughs> overdone, but it's, they're instructive. Wesley had largely reached out to the working poor. And by the time that his life was coming to an end, the working poor were becoming the middle class in England during the Industrial Revolution. Now, I don't think Wesley gets the full credit for this, but he did help because he helped that group stop using their money for bad stuff and start using it for good stuff, like educating their kids and, you know, taking care of their, where they live and that sort of thing. So the Methodists were becoming wealthier. And Wesley began to realize, I need to help them make sense of what to do with money because they never really knew what to do with it before. And now that they've got more of it, how are they going to deal with it? So Wesley, Wesley uh, took his three simple rules and he established sort of three simple rules of dealing with wealth. First, he said, make all you can in a way that does not harm yourself or others, right? So for example, Wesley was not a big fan of people who own liquor shops. Um, now, Wesley wasn't a teetotaler, but he argued if you're gonna make your money off of the misery of others, you're hurting them and you're hurting yourself in the process. So that's not within bounds for Methodism. So you can make all you want. We, he, and no problem with people making lots of money, but make it in a way that doesn't hurt others. This still drives our general board of pension today in the United Methodist Church. They have a social screening that they do so that what they invest in is something that doesn't hurt anyone in the process of it. So for example, and this is a while back, but when apartheid was still an issue in South Africa, the United Methodist Church was one of the first to divest from South African assets because that would be making money by hurting people if we kept our money there. To save all you can, save it by refraining to buy stuff you don't need. One of the things that irritated Wesley deeply was the need for middle class folks to buy what he called luxury goods. Basically, that's anything you don't need to have. Right? Anything you don't need is something, it's just frivolous. And so don't buy it. Save that money instead by not buying stuff you don't need. This flies in the face of the entire logic of what we're about to experience as all of the Black Friday uh, uh, commercials start jumping on TV for us. You're watching this on only a 60-inch you know, plasma TV, but you need you know, a 62-inch plasma TV now. Um, that's exactly the kind of thing Wesley was saying Methodists don't do. And then finally, he said, all right, so you've made all this money, and now you've saved a whole bundle because you're not going out and buying all this stuff. Well, what do you do with it? He says, here's the danger. It's going to burn a hole through your pocket. That's the way he put it. And it, that hole is going to lead you straight to hell. Um, because you're going to start defining yourself by saying, I'm comfortable, I'm secure in my own means. And if you do that, you've lost your holiness. Because holiness is dependent on God, not on our own ability. So he said, give all you can. Give away all that you can. And he actually, in some of his sermons, would talk about exactly what giving all you can meant. It would include things like, um, actually, really anything beyond if you can clothe yourself and your kids, if you can make sure that all of you stay out of poverty, and if you can make sure that all of you are fed well and are housed, nothing else is really necessary. So just give it away. 
To Wesley's credit, he didn't just preach it, he lived it out. If you look at his books, Wesley was an inveterate note-taker, and he kept all kinds of journals. One of his journals was just his ledger book that showed what he bought and sold and made. Wesley could have been an extremely wealthy man. He sold hundreds and hundreds of copies of, of his different publications, and he published hundreds of different tracts and books over his lifetime. And uh, he had all that money go to the Methodist Association, and then he drew a salary from them, so he wasn't getting it directly. So the first thing is he gave up the right to his royalties and went to the Methodist. And then the Methodists kept wanting to give him raises, and he kept saying no. And what's interesting is at one point they overruled him, and they gave him a raise. When they went back and looked at his books after his death, it showed that he continued spending the exact same amount every year, even after the raise, and just kept giving the excess away. Wesley never, never did any, all that was left when he died, all he had to his name was just enough to provide for his funeral, and that was all, because he had given away all his other money. He had no kids either, so he didn't have to provide for them, so it was all given away. So Wesley lived and practiced what he preached here. But this was, I think, a fascinating piece that Wesley understood that wealth can be a particularly tricky thing in, a, having, a, in a, having us avoid or turn away from the call to holiness. A couple other ways that Wesley called us to engage with the larger world around us. It's not just enough to be able to engage in our daily lives, but we need to be able to engage in specific situations that call for a Christian response. One is in terms of what Wesley would have called acts of mercy. Acts of mercy have to do with meeting the immediate needs of the world. Wesley understood that holiness wasn't just something we strove after in the church, but it's something we should strive after for the rest of the world around us as well. We were trying to reach out and to establish holiness everywhere because all the world belongs to God. And so he said, have compassion on those in need in particular. And those acts of mercy were taking care of people. Wesley was a huge believer in almsgiving. Uh, every so often, at one time, <laughs> it was kind of interesting, in, in his journal, he gets into a sort of... Uh, uh, almsgiving match with another guy he doesn't really like, uh, and so they're seeing who can outgive the other one. So one of the things that Wesley does is that uh, he uh, gives up eating meat for two months, and he only eats potatoes, or so he says, and uh, gives away all the money he would have spent on meat to the poor. The other guy, not to be outdone, only buys turnips, which were cheaper than potatoes, boils the turnips, Right? Then gives the boiled turnips away and only drinks the broth from the boiled turnips. I don't know how much of that is true, but Wesley for once gets outdone by someone else. Notwithstanding, that may be a little extreme, the point is that it was about meeting the needs of those around them. And again, this is early industrial era uh, Britain that they're living in. So there are a lot of the poor that are moving into the major cities, Bristol and London and the like. And they're desperate. They've got no money. The feudal system is broken down, so you don't have lords that are caring for the needy that are within their, their, their domains. And so the Methodists really pick up along the way and try to care for these people that are in desperate need. If you've ever read any of Dickens' novels, you know, like Oliver Twist, and the like, you get a sense of what that was like, but this is about 100 years earlier, the sort of desperate uh, life of the, of the street urchins and the, and the girls that are left on the street and that kind of thing. And, and Wesley and his folks really made a point of reaching out to them. Part of the acts of mercy wasn't just to care for the immediate needs of individuals, but it was also to reach out and to transform the nation as well. Wesley actually speaks in what were called the large minutes. That was sort of like the Book of Discipline in their day. And in it, he says that the purpose of the Methodists, the reason God brought them into existence was this, to reform the nation, especially the church, and to spread scriptural holiness. It wasn't just to do it individually with other people, but to spread it across the nation. They wanted to see the entire nation come to a place where it was living out a kind of holy life. And part of the way that you did that is that you advocated for that which was not holy to be overcome. The big ones for Wesley had to do with slavery and food prices. Wesley was constantly advocating Parliament to abolish the slave trade within the British Empire. And in fact, his very last letter that he writes just a, a few days before his death is to William Wilberforce. And if you know uh, the English British history, you know that Wilberforce 
was one of the small group of MPs in the British Parliament that put forward and, and championed the bill that ultimately ended and abolished slave trade in the British Empire. And Wesley was a force behind Wilberforce to make that happen. Food prices were another thing. He looked at all the desperately hungry people and he'd help them individually with alms, but then he also went on to write treatises to the wealthy saying, here are ways that by your buying uh, certain luxury items that you've driven up prices for everybody. You've caused inflation so that food prices have gone up as well and the poor can no longer afford their own food because of that. So he was looking at making systemic changes to bring holiness to the nation, not just at working with individuals. Here's the thing. Today, we tend to break all this stuff out. We have, you know, there are some churches that are interested in what we call social justice and these systemic changes. Some that want to save souls and to deal with individuals. Wesley just did it all together because it was all part of living a holy life. He said, which part does God not do, right? <laughs> does God not care about the hungry or does God not care about, you know, people going to heaven? Which one is God not concerned about? For Wesley, it was all part of the holy life. All of it needed to be done. And he expected the Methodists to engage in all of it as well. And what was the outcome? The outcome for him was a congregation, if you can call it that, of groups of Methodists, classes, societies of Methodists, that promoted holiness in this kind of holistic way. So that it promoted the well-being of all those who are around it physically, as well as drawing them into glory, ultimately. And it's not a program, right? It's not a program, it's not something you can legislate. It's a way of life, and it's something that had to be owned by the laity. Wesley was the one who sort of launched the whole thing, but it had to be owned by the common people of Britain. And that's the only way that it was able to do what it was able to do. And that's the same challenge that's set before us today as Methodists. That's our inheritance, is whether we're willing to step in and to grab a hold of that way of being that really launches us out to change the world, to spread scriptural holiness across the land. That's what we're called to do. But it starts in the sort of everyday commitments to piety, to mercy, to justice, to receiving the means of grace and to holding each other accountable and being vulnerable to each other in the process. Wesley believed it was possible. I mean, that's the thing. Wesley was an optimist at the end of the day. You might think he was kind of a dour guy when you read him because he was so strict and so absolute about so many things, but Wesley was an inveterate optimist. And uh, one of my favorite lines, this is from O Four Thousand Tongues to Sing, you know the hymn, O Four Thousand Tongues to Sing, right? The very last line was written by Charles Wesley, the same fellow as John Wesley's brother, younger brother. I inflicted three of his hymns on you this morning up in the, uh, at the, the service. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Charles wrote O Four Thousand Tongues. And this captures Wesley's optimism, both John and Charles Wesley's optimism. Anticipate your heaven below and own that love is heaven, right? If we live a life of holiness, we live a life of love of God and love of neighbor. And if we own that love, to live out of love of God and love of neighbor is heaven. It's where we meet God. It's where the beauty and the glory of God is. Then we can live into heaven now. That's what Wesley believed we could do. I and mean, there's nothing less than that kind of power, that kind of glory at stake in all of this for Wesley. It's not just about doing good, and it's not just about humanitarianism. It's about living into the glory of God now. He genuinely believed it was possible. And Charles really captures that well in this last line. And so that's where I would bring it into it and open this up for any questions you may have. But that's what we have at stake as well if we're following in Wesley's footsteps. To to seek after this kind of holiness isn't just about, are we doing what Wesley did? Are we being good Methodists? It's about, are we living into the glory of God now in the anticipation of seeing it face to face one day? And with that, any questions or comments from anyone? I can go off script too, so if you've got specific, <laughs> you know, it doesn't have to be specifically on this. Any questions? <laughs> wow. <laughs> I, <laughs> the, the food coma is set in, yes. Yeah, so that's it. I actually have a question. Please. Do you think that 
did John Wesley make any comments after he had that competition with potatoes and turnips <laughs> about how he fell from grace in becoming competitive in that way? He did, actually. And the, the reason that he wrote about that originally <clears throat> was to talk about how he, uh, it actually is in the context of saying that he didn't like this other guy. And, uh, and then when he shares it, he says, and so I kind of got kicked a little bit to recognize that even people that I don't always agree with and I don't appreciate very much um, can be doing great things for God. So he, he was chastened in that. He, he acknowledges it in this journal. So, yeah. Wesley was intensely self-aware. I mean, almost to a fault, he was introspective. So it's very rare that he, he, those sorts of things escape him. Um, do you have any thoughts on why this the manner in which John Wesley started his movement mm -hmm. and his dedication <coughs> and his slave trade, why the Methodist Church was so comfortable keeping people enslaved for so many decades? Uh, Mary Rollinson can answer that question. She just heard my lecture on it this past <laughs> week. Um, <laughs> yes, I can. The, the answer is that it was different on, on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, in the British church, they were entirely behind Wesley when they abolished it. In the American church, the problem was, because American Methodism, just quick, quick uh, history here, 1784, there was something called the Christmas Conference. And that's when you have the formal break between John Wesley and the American Methodists. The American Methodists have now their own bishops. Wesley didn't want them to be bishops, but they proclaim themselves such anyway. Francis Asbury and Thomas Coke, and uh, they're often running under their own steam at that point. Initially, if you look at the, uh, the primary documents, uh, the American church was deeply abolitionist at the outset, but it began growing. And it began growing especially in the southern colonies and then states um, after the, the Treaty of Paris. And so you have this, uh, Francis Asbury writes in his journal, when he, he would itinerate across the entirety of the 13 states. And uh, he said something to the effect, of, I can't remember the exact quote, but something to the effect of what, what how deeply troubling it was for him um, to be uh, sort of held by slave owners. And what he meant by that is that if he cut out slavery, if he just by fiat had, had enforced the stronger anti-slave position the American ch church had at first, then they would have lost over half their membership. And it might well have killed American Methodism. And so that's why. What it was was a balancing act that said, we're going to hold on to it for right now because we need the church to grow to sustain and we'll work it out later. What Asbury's logic was, and a couple others that agreed with him, big names in the early, church, early American Methodist Church, was, well, what we'll do is rather than making it um, a condition of membership in the church, not to be a slave owner, we'll, we'll push it back and say that it's a condition of being a good member in the church, in effect. So uh, on the holiness scale, right, it wasn't when you first, if, if we were using Wesley's idea, which they weren't, but if we were using Wesley's idea of sort of the class versus the band, you could still come to the class as a slave owner, but if you wanted to join a band, then when you were really getting serious about holiness, then you'd have to give up your slaves. So what they did is sort of kicked it down a little bit and said, eventually we're going to get everybody to give up their slaves. But not at first, because if we do it at the outset, we're going to destroy the capacity of the church to, to survive, just in terms of numbers and money. And one could say, should such a church survive, it is willing to sacrifice so many people. And I just said it. I love Methodism, but at the point when what sin is acceptable in the name of perhaps stopping sin? Well, that's, that's exactly right. And that's why in 1844, you finally have the schism in the church. Um, 1844, you have this vast schism because one of the bishops becomes a slave owner in 1844. And uh, when that happens, the general conference meets and they say, we can't do this anymore. And so you have the creation or the foundation laid for the creation of the Southern Methodist Church, which allowed for slavery, and the Northern Methodist Church, which slowly would abolish it. Um, but it's amazing. I mean, I could go on for a long time. I, I literally wrote the book on this. It's coming out in just a few months. So if you want to read more about it, I'm glad to give you the Amazon address. 
but uh, it's, uh, it's the culture of the region where the church was set that really begins to shape how the church um, defines holiness. And uh, so holiness in America gets thrown up for grabs on a lot of things, including sin. My question is, how much time did Wesley spend with it? Wesley spent very little time in America. He came prior to the launch of the Wesleyan Revival. He was actually in his sort of finding himself phase, right? We send our kids after college to go over to Europe to backpack around and find themselves. When he finished Oxford, he came to the colonies, um, and uh, to the American colonies. He lived in Georgia for about two years. And he uh, was there as a chaplain uh, to the Georgia colony under James Oglethorpe, the, uh, the governor there. He came hoping to do uh, missionary work with the Native Americans and with the slaves. And he did a little bit, but most of the time he spent uh, running uh, schools for the, the youth that were in the colony, the, the settlers from Britain that were in the colony. He had a miserable time. He ended up falling in love with a girl named Sophie Hockey while he was there. But he didn't have enough guts to ask her to marry him, um, to be very honest about it. And uh, so the, and the, the father of the girl um, was a pretty high-ranking person in the colony and got tired of waiting for Wesley to ask, so married her off to someone else. And Wesley got so angry, he refused communion to the family when they came to the church the next Sunday. Wesley was brought up on charges for insubordination and had to leave uh, the colony in disgrace. <laughs> so, do you mention business in the general conference? Mm -hmm. Do you think we need to make changes in our governance structure to increase church growth? That's a short answer, yes, and I'll tell you why. Um, it goes back to what I said for Wesley structure was at the beck and call of the mission. So if it wasn't promoting holiness in others, then he changed the structure. Now, Wesley was working at a time when obviously everything was much more fluid. He didn't have big bureaucratic structures to work with. He was the final say, so he could do that. But it wasn't until 1900, and then again in the General Conference of 1904, with the new, the rewriting of the, the uh, Constitution of the Methodist Episcopal Church, that we had the bureaucratic structure created that we've come to know and love today. Um, up until then, for such a large movement, there was roughly, by the end of the 19th century in American Methodism, around 5.7% of all Americans in the entire population of the United States was a member of the Methodist Episcopal Church. It's a huge number. Um, and it was growing. It would grow up to a little over 6% by the early 20th century. It was amazingly nimble and able to, to change its structures in, in light of mission. So what it did to deal with the Civil War, I mean, it created a bunch of stuff, and when the Civil War was over, it shifted it and moved it over to a different set of things. <laughs> Unfortunately, it moved to a more professionalized and bureaucratized model that kind of ossified by uh, the, the early 20th century. And I think that we've, um, and that's where this change began to take from helping laity to be more actuated and empowered to engage in mission, to being primarily just donors. And again, I mean, to speak to Tom's point, I'm not against donating, right? I mean, that's a good thing. But it used to be much more than that. And, uh, and because we ossified and professionalized and bureaucratized the structures in the early 20th century, we have hamstrung ourselves from being able to focus better on mission. Um, and the 19th century Methodist shows us it's not impossible to be a big movement and still have a fairly readily shifting um, structural system that's accountable to mission, rather than mission that has to be defined by what's already in place to do it. Wesley was 
talking about how we hold each other accountable and stay vulnerable and grow in holiness together. So it's the work of a congregation or a small group. Social justice, and he didn't use the term simply because there wasn't that term in his day. He talked about acts of mercy that would have included social justice in our language today. Um, social justice was about systemic change, so things like attacking slavery and trying to bring it down. That that's where that would be included. And he did both. He just didn't have the language of social justice the way we use it today. So we learned so much from you today. We thank you so much. For Loving God, we thank you so much for the inspiration and passion that we have experienced through Dr. T. Stale today. And as we go forth from this place, may we embody truly the holiness in our lives and live it out and share our love with everyone that we encounter. And we uh, thank you for the wisdom um, and the teaching of Dr. T. Stale. And we pray that it will continue to be with him, inspire him, um, so that in his uh, teaching and preaching and pastoring that your glory might be revealed. And be with each one of us and help us to share the wisdom that we have learned today with others and help us to practice them in our daily life as well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.